Alrighty class, um, now we're going to go into the heart. So Patel's upped his game a little bit. What do you think of this uh, little uh, gift there? It's oddly disturbing yet very satisfying. It's just, <laughs> I mean, if you look at the valves, it's like, what's going on here? But it's uh, you can't take your eyes off of it. It's, it's, it's a very interesting gift. Uh, but anyways, Welcome to the heart. Um, so before we talk about the heart, you know, falling in love, uh, according to neuroscientists, the first stage of romantic love releases the same neurotransmitters that your brain will release during a high from a drug. So falling in love is like cocaine. Um, it's chemical. We start to crave time with that person in the same way the body craves any other addiction. Dopamine, which is associated with feelings of euphoria, surges when we are around the object of our affection, or even if we think about them. This makes us desperate to get more and more of that high. Here's a good uh, artisan's conception of the human heart, and we'll definitely talk more about this. Uh, the pulmonary and systemic circuits. Uh, pulmonary circuit, blood flows from the right heart to the lungs. Okay, so we go, you have unoxygenated blood that comes into the right heart, then it's gonna get pumped into the pulmonary circuit where the lungs will oxygenate it. So when hemoglobin uh, matches with the oxygen, it turns a nice bright red color and it will oxygenated blood will come back into the left side of the heart and the left side of the heart will send it out into the system. Um, so blood flows from the right heart to the lungs. Gas exchange occurs in the lungs and then oxygen is loaded into the blood. We breathe out carbon dioxide. That's why it's good to talk to your plants because the plants will take the carbon dioxide and then make more oxygen in the air and then we breathe in the oxygen. So it's a symbiotic relationship. Uh, the systemic circuit, blood flows from the left heart to the all body organs and gas exchange takes place in the organs and it will take the unoxygenated blood and return it back to the heart. And all this can be done under a minute. So it takes a drop of blood roughly 20 to 60 seconds to travel this whole circuit. Um, the dual system of the human body, uh, just like what we had talked about, blood flows from the right atrium to the right ventricle where it's pumped into the pulmonary circuit. The blood is the pulmonary artery branches is low in oxygen but relatively high in carbon dioxide. Gas exchange occurs in the pulmonary capillaries and blood high in oxygen and low in carbon dioxide is returned to the left atrium. From here blood enters the left ventricle which pumps it from the systemic circuit following exchange in the systemic capillaries and carbon dioxide and wastes in. Blood returns to the right atrium and the cycle is repeated. Position, size, and shape of the heart. Um, the heart is located in the mediastinum, which is right in the middle of your chest here. And it, the apex is slightly to the left, so that's why a lot of people think that the heart is on the left side, but really it's in the center. It's just slightly tilted to the left side. Okay. Position of the heart. And so if you look at the heart right here, it's actually located uh, right near ribs two, three, four, and five, and near thoracic vertebrae T4 through T9 there, okay? So if you can look at that right in there, that's where the heart is. The heart is located within the thoracic cavity, medially between the lungs in the mediastinum. It's about the size of a fist, and it's broad on top and tapers toward the base of the left. So here's a nice surface anatomy of the heart. Again, this is a superior vena cava where deoxygenated blood comes from the face and the upper extremity. You have unoxygenated blood, deoxygenated, comes from the trunk and lower extremity. And then you have cardiac veins that will dump into the right side or the right atrium. And here's the aorta that will get blood uh, pumped from the left ventricle and it'll pump it throughout the body. Um, the right ventricle will pump it in through the pulmonary trunk and pulmonary artery and we'll look at this a little bit more in detail so it all makes sense. The blood supply to the heart itself, um, now when that's compromised, that's when you have a heart attack or a myocardial infarction. So remember, a stroke is a blood supply to the brain is compromised, but a heart attack is a blood supply to the heart is compromised and then you have pulmonary veins. See, in reality, we always think arteries are bright red uh, and they're going away from the heart. And that's 99% of the case that's true. 
but in the heart you have pulmonary arteries that are actually deoxygenated and they're going to the lung so since it's an anomaly it's a good quiz question that the pulmonary arteries uh, all, they're going away from the heart but they have deoxygenated uh, blood and then pulmonary veins are coming back to the heart but they actually have oxygen rich blood so it's the it's the one of the few exceptions in the body uh, where arteries are not uh, oxygenated but most of the time arteries are bright red uh, pressurized and veins are kind of that blue blood that we talk about and uh, not a lot of pressure okay if you look at this this is the opening so you have the superior vena cava again inferior vena cava dumps into the right atrium then we have the right tricuspid valve or the right atrioventricular valve goes through these valves and goes to the right ventricle. The right ventricle pumps through the pulmonary valve, um, semilunar valve, then the pulmonary trunk, and then through the right and left pulmonary arteries. Again, these arteries have deoxygenated blood. Then the lungs will do their thing in the pulmonary circuit, and then bright red blood will come back via the pulmonary veins into our left atrium, into the aortic, no, the left bicuspid or mitral valve, the left AV valve, okay, then to the left ventricle. The left ventricle is a lot thicker than the right because it's got to pump blood all the way to your body, so it's going to pump it through the aortic semilunar valve, through the aortic arch, down to the thoracic aorta, and down to the abdominal aorta. And we'll say this probably five or six more times throughout the lecture. Remember, it takes you about seven times to hear it over and over again so that you understand the material. And here's the pericardium right here. So your your heart, imagine a, a deflated balloon and your heart sits into that deflated balloon right in there. Okay, so right there. Sometimes this pericardial sac can get irritating, you get pericarditis. It's kind of like uh, rubbing sandpaper together. So a lot of uh, patients can hear crackling sound or a sharp discomfort right in here. Uh, it's treated with anti-inflammatories or some pain medication. Uh, what causes it? Mm, could be a bacterial infection, could be viral, uh, just could be irritation in general, but it usually goes away. The heart has three layers, uh, the epicardium, the myocardium, and the endocardium. Okay, So you have the serous membrane. The myocardium is the cardiac muscle. That's the real thick, and then the endocardium lines the chambers there. All right, and then the endocardium lines the chambers, which is simple squamous epithelium. Uh, here's another view. Here's the endocardium, the myocardium, and the epicardium here. So the chambers uh, we introduced, that's the left and right atria, thin-walled, are the superior ones. They're separated by the intraarterial septum. They're the receiving chambers. The auricles, um, they're like ear-like uh, extensions of the atria to help receive a little bit more uh, blood. And then you have the pectinate muscles, which are the internal ridges that uh, will help contract the atria. Now the left and right ventricles are a lot thicker. They're inferior. They're separated by the interventricular septum, anterior, posterior, interior interventricular sulci overlie it. They're the pumping chambers of the heart and they have what we call trabeculae carnae on the internal ridges and that's what helps give them uh, the pumping action or the contraction. Okay so in the atria you have pectinate muscles that will help contract and the trabeculae carnae in the ventricles. Here's a great view of the heart itself. Um, again, here's the superior vena cava, inferior vena cava that has deoxygenated blood, comes first into the right atrium. The right atrium will then send deoxygenated blood through the right atrioventricular valve or the right tricuspid valve. These little guys are chordae tendinae, and this is called the papillary muscle. Basically, it prevents the valve from uh, folding in and on, its, on itself, strings like a parachute. Okay, so when the blood flows through here and when it fills up, it'll close shut. So when these guys close, remember the heart sound is a lub-dub, lub-dub. So the closing of the atrioventricular valves on the right and left side is what makes the first heart sound the lub. 
the closing of the semilunar valves, the pulmonary and the aortic, makes the dub. So you get the lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. Okay, and then when you go to the physician, uh, the doctor is going to try to listen for that lub dub, lub dub. We may hear a lub sh dub, lub sh, sh dub, or a lub dub sh. And that could tell us that we have a heart murmur, which are abnormal sounds. And it could say that, okay, this valve is not closing. This one's stenotic. This one, uh, there's an issue. So depending on where they hear the sound, there's four places they can, they can hear. They can listen uh, here for the aortic. They can hear for the pulmonic. Uh, uh, they can hear the mitral valve down here. Okay. Um, so there are different areas that we can listen to, and I'll show you a, a nice little uh, diagram in just a second here. All right, here's what the heart muscle looks like. Um, again, the right ventricle uh, is a lot thinner than the left ventricle because the right ventricle only has to pump into the lungs where the left ventricle has to pump into the entire body. Uh, the valves here, if you look at that, the atrioventricular valves close when the ventricles contract, okay? So the right AV or tricuspid valve, you have a left AV formerly known as the bicuspid or mitral valve. Um, a lot of people get murmurs at the mitral valve. Again, murmurs are just abnormal heart sounds. Uh, they can be innocent or they could be uh, something that we need to, or abnormal that we need to uh, uh, keep an eye on. Uh, sometimes they're just keep uh, kept uh, under watch and sometimes they need uh, surgery to uh, fix. It depends on the individual. Uh, you have tendinous cords that tether the valves to the papillary muscles to make sure that the valves don't fold in on each other. And then you have semilunar valves uh, close when the ventricles relax. Okay, so AV valves close when the ventricles contract. Semilunar valves close when the ventricles relax. Pulmonary valve is the exit of the right ventricle, and then aortic valve is at the exit of the left ventricle. Alrighty, continue on. Here's what the heart valves will look like. Okay, there's a tricuspid valve. Here's a nice little sheep dissection here, the chordae tendinae, the papillary muscles, the trabeculae carnae. We'll be doing that uh, in lab, hopefully. Heart valves, another view of it. There's the aortic valve, there's the pulmonary valve, there's the bicuspid valve and the tricuspid valve. The operation of the heart valves, again, uh, here's the atrium of the right atrium, the left atrium. The blood will flow in. As soon as the ventricles fill up, they'll close these AV valves shut, and that's your first lub, and then they'll pump the blood into the pulmonary trunk, then the arteries, and then the aorta. And as soon as these guys shut, you'll get the dub. So you get the lub, dub, lub, dub. Oh, the science of love. Serotonin levels in the brain drop dramatically. Since serotonin usually regulates our mood, we start feeling these positive emotions toward the other person even more strongly. This causes that crazy love that we feel when the person in question. In fact, after six months of this madly in love stage of dating, our serotonin levels actually hit the same level as someone with OCD. So we are literally compulsively obsessed with that person we love. That's why it can hurt so much to end a relationship at this stage, despite the short duration. So if you've ever had a breakup uh, um, during that time, you know, the first puppy love stage before the six months, uh, that's a tough breakup. Um, and that's hard to, uh, hard to recover from. Now, again, uh, the pathway of blood uh, through the heart. Uh, blood enters the right atrium from the superior and inferior vena cava, right here. The blood in the right atrium flows through the right AV valve and the right ventricle. Contraction of the right ventricle forces the pulmonary valve open. Boom. Blood flows through the pulmonary valve into the pulmonary trunk. Blood is distributed by right and left pulmonary arteries to the lungs where it unloads carbon dioxide and loads oxygen. Blood returns from lungs via the pulmonary veins into the left atrium. Blood in the left atrium flows through the left AV valve into the left ventricle. 
contraction of left ventricle simultaneous with step three forces the aortic to open. Blood flows through aortic valve into the ascending aorta, and then it goes through the brachiocephalic, common carotid, and subclavian. Blood returns to the right atrium via the vena cava. So it takes, uh, again, anywhere from 20 to 60 seconds for a drop of blood to go from the heart all the way into the body and back to the vena cava. Uh, coronary circulation, of course, the heart has its own circulation. Uh, blockage can cause the myocardial infarction, which is a death of heart tissue. Uh, left coronary artery, which is the left CA, anterior interventricular branch, left anterior descending, is also known as the widow maker because a blockage of this can pretty much lead your significant other to be a widow. Um, then you have the right coronary artery, which is the right marginal branch, posterior interventricular branch. Um, here is the circulatory system of the heart. So here's the right coronary artery. Here's the left coronary artery. If you go here, here's the anterior interventricular branch. Okay. Here's the great cardiac vein. Right coronary artery, right marginal branch, posterior interventricular branch. Okay. Here's the coronary sinus. Venous drainage of cardiac muscle. Small cardiac veins drain 20% of the blood directly into the chambers, especially the right ventricle. Uh, most blood, 80%, is re returned to the right atrium through the coronary sinus, which receives from the great cardiac vein, posterior interventricular middle cardiac vein, and the left marginal vein. Cardiac muscle itself, if you've uh, looked at the histology, remember they have these intercalated discs. So cardiomyocytes are joined to ends by intercalated discs. Uh, they have interdigitating folds, resemble the little egg cartons. Um, they have mechanical junctions and desm zones, which are real tight. Uh, and then electrical junctions, the gap junction. So the intercalated disc allows electrical uh, action potentials to go from one part to another. Hence, the intercalated discs are the key to cardiac muscle. What about the nerve supply to the heart? Well, remember it's under autonomic nervous system, modulates the heart's intrinsic activity. Uh, the sympathetic division stimulates the heart with cardiac nerves from cervical ganglia. Innervation of the myocardium, stimulation increases the force of contraction. Now the parasympathetic division slows the heart with the activity of the vagus nerves. Remember 90% of the parasympathetic division is in the uh, controlled by the cranial nerve 10, which is the vagus nerve. Uh, the right vagus nerve innervates mainly the SA node, and then the left vagus nerve innervates mainly the AV node, and we'll definitely talk about that in just a second. We'll end this section with some congenital defects of the heart. Um, the first one is the a patent foraminal valley defect is an abnormal opening in the intra-arterial septum, or more commonly a failure of the foraminal valley to close. When the baby's in the mother's womb, uh, doesn't really uh, gets his blood supply from the mother. So even though the blue blood technically and the red blood are mixing together, um, it doesn't hinder the child as much. But when the child is born and takes the first breath, this foramen valley should uh, spontaneously, the flap should close so that no longer the deoxygenated blood is no longer mixing with the oxygenated blood. Um, if that fails to close, the baby can have a bluish tinge. And um, usually they'll monitor for a couple days to see if it closes. If not, then they might need to do surgery to close that. Now, the uh, baby can also have a co of the aorta is an abnormal narrowing of the aorta, which is right here. Um, what about a patent ductus arteriosum? Uh, is the failure of the ductus arteriosus to close? So the ductus arteriosus is a is a vein. Uh, I'm sorry, vein. A little small little artery uh, in the heart that has allows deoxygenated and oxygenated blood to mix here. Um, again, we don't need that as an adult, so it becomes a ligament. Um, and if that fails, if that remains open, then that could be a problem later on because you have unoxygenated blood mixing with oxygenated blood. Um, and then the tetralogy of phallet includes an abnormal opening in the intraventricular septum. Well, that could be a big problem because you have uh, unoxygenated blood mixing with oxygenated blood. Okay, so these, these might require surgery.